Mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Who do you identify with and care for deeply? Paul is lamenting the plight of his kinsmen who reject Christ as Savior. It saddens him. So who do you identify with on this deep sort of level? As we go through life, we learn to identify with groups. Classmates, we learn, you know, one homeroom is more well-liked than another homeroom. Or later we learn school pride, we have pep rallies because our school is better than somebody else's school. Family pride, even here in Sevierville, there are a few names that if you drop them, oh, you're part of that clan, you must know what's going on in town. We all should be proud of the different things we're associated with, even our church, church pride. As when I first relocated here, we went to what was it then the Miracle. It's the, it's the, what is it, the Smoky Mountain Opry now. But we went and we had a meal there. It was really nice. And we were talking afterwards. The pro program was really nice. And we met some folks. And a really nice old Baptist woman told, couldn't help herself from inviting a Lutheran pastor to go to church with her on Sunday. <laughs> and, and I was really, I was actually impressed with the fact that she was so excited about her church, she would even invite someone who was busy every Sunday morning <laughs> doing the very same thing. Vocational pride. We all have vocational pride, or at least we should. We take time to learn that vocation and people, and it's throughout history. There were guilds and different businesses here in town take pride in what they do and what they produce. We teach pride and association of groups really well in the military. You know, right after high school, I went in a big room with 80 people, and two or three people screamed at us and told us what to do for eight weeks. And that made us cohesive as a group. We had someone in common that we could all dislike together. God made us all part of all these little communities in our lives for a reason, it's not accidental. Cohesion, yes. Learning to work together, to trust each other, to care for each other. All opportunities provided by God for us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. This is the kind of feeling Paul was experiencing in tonight's text. He was a Jew of Jews. He was one of society's elite. He was well-educated, probably on his way to becoming groomed to be one of their teachers, one of their intellectuals in God's law and God's word. But Paul was now persona non grata. He had been stoned, he had been chased down, he had been persecuted. He had been placed in shackles and imprisoned by his own people. And the Romans had something to do with it, too. And he longs, he longs deeply to share, even with those who persecute him, the truth about Christ. We all know that Christ calls us to share our faith in our vocations, wherever we are. Share his truth in love. And for the most part, that's fairly easy in our close-knit circles, the people that we're close to, those who we know and trust. It's easy to share our faith in those circles, even if they don't believe or they believe in a different way, it's often easy for us, with people we know and trust and love, to have those conversations. Paul is giving us an example here of praying for your enemies. The Jewish people who reject Christ in the first century see Paul as a threat. So praying for and speaking the truth about Christ to them, his persecutors, was no easy task. But pray and preach he did to the ends of the earth. 
I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying, Paul says. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Paul is not only praying for and speaking the truth in love to his persecutors. He has great sorrow over their lost condition. Paul even wished he could give up his place in the eternal time with God. He, he laments, maybe I could give up my spot. Of course, we know it doesn't work that way. We do not own our place with Christ in all eternity. It belongs to the one who purchased it with his blood on the cross. So that he is the only one who can give that spot away. But the thing is, there's no shortage of spaces. He's purchased enough spaces for everyone at his side for all eternity. So Paul's desire to give up his spot, so to speak, just shows how deeply it pains him. He would be willing to spend eternity separated from God rather than see his kinsmen, kinsmen suffer in the same way for rejecting the promised Messiah. He laments, like a parent, maybe you could relate to this as a parent, who would gladly give up their seat, the last seat on a lifeboat that was getting ready to leave a ship, without a second thought. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ. This is a pretty scary wish for Paul to make. But he does so for the sake of his brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He does not want to be cut off from Christ, but he would gladly spend eternity in anguish on their behalf. That is a deep regard, a deep feeling for one's kinsmen. That's some pretty deep-seated brotherly love. And his prayer for them is the same that we should have. For all who live in darkness, those who we expose to close by and those far away, those who we know and love, and those who are our enemies that we are called to pray for, those who persecute us, bullies and thieves and cheats. And we are in a society today even though they're not throwing rocks at us in the world of political ideas, we are being stoned on a regular basis for standing for God's truth. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the, pa the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is the God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Our Savior came through them, to them, and through them to us all. We should feel for the lost, as Paul does for his kinsmen. In Jesus' name, amen.